حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give thabat and sabr to our brothers and sisters in Gaza We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept their shuhada We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them sabr We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect them to, to send down his sakina and rahmah To make their iman a means of fortification for them we ask Allah to forgive us for our own shortcomings and for our own incapacity. To Allah we complain of our weakness. mushtaka. Sisters and brothers, it's at times like these that our iman is tested. It's at times like these that our iman is tested. These trials, these tribulations, one of the main wisdoms behind them is that through these trials, iman is manifested. Faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is demonstrated. It is only iman that can give us hope during times of darkness. It is only iman that can possibly make us optimistic when we feel that there is no help on this world. Then our iman will remind us we don't need help of this world when Allah azza wa is our mawla. Allah is our mawla. We don't need anyone else's help. In yansur it is only Iman that will help us overcome these types of tragedies. Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us in the Quran, Am hasibatum an tadkhulul jannah? Did you think you will enter Jannah for free? Do you think Jannah is there for the taking? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, Walamma yatikum mathalu ladin akhalu min qablikum. You have yet to really recognize and see the examples of those before you. You haven't been tested the way they have been tested. Masatum al baasa wa darrau. Every type of trial came down upon them. Trials in their monetary, in their risk, in their sustenance. Trials of bloodshed came down. Wazulzilu. They were shaken to the core until even their prophets and the believers they're going, they were asking where is the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah reminds us this ayah was revealed when the Muslims were being persecuted to death. This ayah was revealed when they would see Bilal being dragged in the streets of Mecca. When multiple Sahaba, including the one I have been named after Yasir and his wife Sumayya, they were literally shred to bits. And the Muslims were saying, where is the help of Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, did you think Jannah is cheap? Jannah is free? You have yet to be tested like the people before you were tested. And so Allah Azza wa Jal tested them. And Allah Azza wa Jal through their tests and trials and tribulations showed us what happens when you put your trust in Allah. What happens at the end of tests and trials? Nasr only comes after sabr. Allah's help only comes after sabr. And when you have sabr and when you have tawakkul, then and only then, Will Allah's Nasr come unto you? And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminded us that we must always think good thoughts of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala no matter what the situation. It is our Iman that gives us hope. For those that have gone on, for those that have lost their lives, we have to console ourselves that indeed what they have with Allah is infinitely better than what they had over here. They have been released from the prisons of the dunya. They have been released from the starvations of the dunya. And they are not dead. We have yaqeen in Allah that all thousand plus people who passed away in the last few days and all of the shuhada of all of these decades, we have yaqeen, certain yaqeen, they are not dead. Their lives now are more real than our lives. And their enjoyment and their ni'mah that they are in is infinitely better than anything we can imagine. And so for those that have gone on, we make dua for them and we know they're in a better place. And for those who are remaining, we make dua that Allah gives them sabr. And for those who are perpetrating the dhulm, for those that are doing these deeds, I just recited the verses, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ Never think, never think that Allah is unaware of what the Zalim is doing. Allah is delaying them for the day of Hisab. Our Prophet ﷺ said, Allah Azza wa Jal sometimes allows some time for the Zalim, but He never lets go of him. He gives him some leeway, but He never lets go of him until finally when He holds on to him, He will give him a severe reckoning and accounting. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave comfort to the believers in Surah Zukhruf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Zukhruf that there are two options, O Muslims. There are two options. You will get one of the two of them. Allah Azza wa Jal says, either you will leave in this world 
And don't worry, we shall get vengeance on your behalf. This is an amazing verse. Allah is speaking to the early Muslims. Allah is speaking to the first batch. And Allah is saying, not all of you are going to see the conquest of Mecca. Not all of you are going to see the results in this world. But don't worry. If we take you away, if your lives are going to be gone, O Muslims, we are muntaqimun. We are going to extract our vengeance from them. Your lives will not be in vain. Allah will deal with those who took your lives. Or if you're allowed to remain here and you stay in this world, then we will show you our power over them. One of two options. Ihdal Husnayna Surah Tawbah says, one of two options. Either you go in this world and in the akhirah you will see judgment, or in this world you will see the power that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has over them. What is our job? Surah Zukhruf says, Fastamsik billadi uhilek. You have to hold on to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. So, sisters and brothers, in light of the tragedies today and Allahu A'lam what we're going to be seeing in the next few days and weeks, I have three disjointed talks, three quick points to make. They're not exactly related, but they are inshallah ta'ala relevant together. First and foremost, first and foremost, we have to recognize that there is wisdom in what is going on. It's painful. Wallahi, it's painful. But the Quran teaches us the Sunnah teaches us, the Seerah teaches us that we must always presume every calamity has more pros than cons. Even if life is lost, even if honor is taken, even if harm is done, the net result will always be better for the Ummah. This is a consistent theme of the Seerah. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions when one of the most tragic incidents of the Seerah, the, the slander of Aisha happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran, لا تحسبوه شر لكم بل هو خير لكم. Don't think what happened is bad. It is for your benefit. You're going to see the good. And we saw the good that came out of that as well. For example, after Hudaybiyah, which was one of the lowest of lows, the Sahaba were so tragically depressed. They were sad. So much so, even Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he raised his voice and he said, how can this be happening, Ya Rasulullah? Are we not upon the truth and they upon batil? Even he somewhat lost his cool and he raised his voice and Abu Bakr had to calm him down, literally drag him down and basically tell him, be quiet, Ya Umar. Abu Bakr had to tell him this. His emotions got the better of him. How can this be happening? And what did Allah reveal? What did Allah reveal when the Sahaba were feeling so low? When they thought this is a manifest loss? Allah revealed one of the most optimistic surahs and verses in the whole Quran. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. This is not a defeat. This is a victory. This is not a defeat. This is a victory. Even though when it happened, they had no idea how can this be a victory. But as the seerah shows, as we went over, this incident turned out to be the biggest victory, even though it was not a military victory. But it was a victory of politics, a victory of the media, victory of da'wah, as I explained when I went over the seerah. The point is that when they were down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, no, this is a victory. It is not a defeat. The same happened in the battle of Uhud as well. Once again, a very tragic time. Once again, a very sad time. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that there is a wisdom in this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that one of the wisdoms is that you're going to see لِيَعْلَمَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلِيَعْلَمَ الَّذِينَ نَافَقُوا You will see the real believers from the real hypocrites. There was a wisdom in the battle of Uhud. What was that wisdom? The Muslims did not see and recognize how evil this fifth column within their own ranks was. This group that was later called the hypocrites. When Uhud happened, they didn't know the term hypocrites. When Uhud happened, they never thought there's something called hypocrites. And Allah says in the Quran, basically in the words that I'm rephrasing, I needed to show you how evil these people were. You needed to see that in the 11th hour, they would backstab you. They would literally turn their backs and walk out on you. I needed you to recognize how evil the hypocrites were. And in the Quran, therefore, Allah mentions one of the wisdoms of the battle of Uhud that so that you may know the reality of those who have done nifaq, who have done hypocrisy. And therefore, brothers and sisters, one of the wisdoms, especially for us outside of the area taking place, one of the wisdoms that we need to appreciate in the light of the battle of Uhud is the reality of those who are on the side of Allah, on the side of the messenger, on the side of the ummah versus those who are on the side of the oppressor. 
It is now time to call out, to name and shame. It is now time to see the reality. Who is speaking in defense of the people that are being killed and whose silence is loud and deafening? Whose silence is loud and deafening? It is now time to call out those people who are instead of siding with the oppressed, they're jumping over them and wanting to establish ties with the apartheid regime. They want to establish relationships with the very oppressors and turn their backs upon a cause that was one of the most important causes of the ummah. For 80 years, the ummah had been united. For 80 years, the Muslim and the Fasikh, the one who was practicing and even the one who was not practicing, the entire ummah had been united that this cause is a cause that is deep to our hearts. Only in the last few years has the rhetoric changed. And we've seen groups of people, they want to normalize with the oppressor. They want to turn their backs on the oppressed. Wallahi, this is a blessing in disguise for us to see the reality of what is going on here. And I gave a sermon or a khatar a few weeks ago, a few months ago about red lines. And I mentioned one of these red lines of this notion of combining all the faiths, of this notion of normalizing. And we see this reality now. How can you normalize? with groups of people who are going to bomb children in hospitals. How can you normalize with the most oppressive regime on the face of this earth currently? So we have to call it out and say that if this is not nifaq, then what is nifaq? And you know, sisters and brothers, I'm somebody who by and large, I don't mention politics too much. Wallahi, not because I'm scared, but because the reality is Allah will ask us about us more than the politicians. That's the reality. There is no fear, inshallah ta'ala. In the end of the day, I find always commenting on politicians and rulers and bad-mouthing them, even if they deserve it, even if they deserve it, what did I gain? What did you gain? But once in a while, we do need to call this out. Wallahi, it is shameful. It is shameful that those in positions of power have neglected their power. How will they answer Allah? Of what value was that power? Of what value was that army? Of what value was that izza that they have? Where are the kingdoms and where are the muluk and where are the presidents right now and I say this is a matter of shame wallahi not a single person has st stood up that has been given izza. we are using our minor platforms we're using our voices whatever we have how about those that have been given a much more powerful voice how about those that have an actual an actual piece on the table of politics how can at this stage you ignore what is going on but we see the reality of such people and so we pay heed just like the sahaba understood in the battle of Uhud the reality of the group of munafiqun so too we call out such people and say, if now your politics and if now your positions are not going to be handy, then why do we need you? Of what value are you? Actually, your presence is more harmful to us than your absence. And I especially call on those Muslims who have been elected to positions of power in Western lands. We all said there's some benefit in Muslims being there. And inshallah, there's some benefit for those who do something. But if you are absolutely silent, if you are doing absolutely nothing, and I want to be clear here, I understand elected politicians cannot speak like I'm speaking right now. Wallahi, I understand. But something, something has to be done. Show your conscience. You have to answer Allah, not me, not your constituents. We put you there. Allah put you there. This is Allah Azza wa Jal giving you power. Allah has given you a modicum of izza and respect in all of these lands. In every single Western country, there are Muslim politicians. I call out to them in particular of what value is your presence in politics if when we need you the most we hear nothing but silence and I say loudly and boldly everybody here make a note of who is silent make a note of who's not saying anything so that we don't need these people I am not somebody who's saying just because a Muslim is in politics that is good for us no by Allah if at this stage and time these people can do nothing then we'd rather have a non-Muslim and do as you please so that we don't have a traitor in that kursi that somebody else can occupy and I'm not a person who generally gets involved in politics but once in in a while a spade needs to be called a spade so this is one of the benefits that actually comes out of these types of trials and tribulations a second reality and again these are awkward realities but wallahi you know i was debating even to say this or not i recognize emotions are high i recognize sometimes things are said allah allah protect all of us i'm going to make some comments in the second point if you disagree with me no problem let's have a back and forth but I feel very strongly about this, very strongly about this. Right now, right now especially, when un 
un like it is crystal clear who the oppressor is and who the oppressed is. This is like night and day, black and white. At this stage of the game, if there are people out there that are calling for disunity, if there are people out there that are actually pointing fingers at the oppressed right now and blaming the oppressed in any way, fashion or form, then I'm sorry, but you have lost the plot completely. Now, what am I referring to here? This is an awkward topic. Just bear with me a little bit. As you know, this is my masjid. I know my, my, my videos go viral, but you are my masjid. You know me. And you know me. I've been here four and a half, five years. I'm always calling for Muslim unity as much as possible. You know this. And I've never once, you know, bad in a group or a name or a scholar. I'm not going to do it today as well. It's not my methodology. I look at the good in every trend, in every madhab, in every maslak. But there are certain ideas that are harmful. There are certain ideas that are harmful to the ummah. And at times like this, that harm is manifested. What do I mean? Without mentioning any groups or names, some people have a very simplistic understanding of how to analyze these very complex issues. And they will say, for example, the problem is that we don't have a khilafah, that's why this is happening. Or they will say, the problem is that these Palestini ulama are not preaching tawheed, that's why they're being punished. Or they will say, this group is full of bid'ah and fisq, and that's why this is happening. Now, this type of rhetoric at this stage, even if it comes from good intention, wallahi, you are harming the ummah. You are harming the ummah. Now I understand that some people find comfort in simplistic analysis. Because it's very complicated. And to just jump on a very easy solution. The problem is those ulama follow a different understanding of Islam. The problem is that we, these people are not calling for a khilafah. The problem is these people are not preaching my version of Tawheed. I understand some people's minds like to find comfort in really simplistic notions. And so it's a really complicated world. So they come across the simple slogan and they say, yes, if they only call for Tawheed, then this would not be happening. But I have to say, sisters and brothers who follow any of these interpretations, I'm trying to be gentle here. For the love of Allah, ask your fitrah, ask your common sense that Allah has given you. You're going to blame those people because they follow a different understanding of Islam. You're going to blame bombs being falling on them because you think that they're not establishing a khilafah. And because of this, the priority now is to ignore them, but to think of a khilafah. And I speak from experience here. Last time this happened, I was raising funds for Gaza. Last time this happened. And one famous person, I'm not going to mention names here, he literally opposed the raising of funds for Gaza. And he said, this is a waste of time. Until you guys establish the Khilafah, this is a joke. And it made my blood boil. Not only is he himself doing nothing as he lives in Darul Kufr and takes benefits from the government, not only is he doing nothing except talk, he's actively preventing people from doing good. Another famous sheikh, again, no names mentioned. I'm not going to mention names here. Another famous sheikh, again, these are well-known people. They, they, this person said, the problem is they haven't understood Tawheed. And if they understood Tawheed, this is the solution. And again, I'm trying to be not too harsh here. But لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله A generation whose women are willing to sacrifice their children for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A generation who 80 years has been giving their blood for the sake of the kalima. An entire sha'ab whose yaqeen in Allah has not been shaken after all that has happened. And you dare come and you say, they don't understand Tawheed. I am sorry, but la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. They have manifested iman and Tawheed a million times better than all of you in your kitab at Tawheed. I'm sorry to be blunt here, but that is a reality. This is a disease and a problem where you're going to blame a population that is being bombed because they follow a different understanding of Islam. Please, sisters and brothers, I I don't want to be too harsh here, but open your minds. I was a bit harsh, I know, but open your minds. Open your minds. The problem is not in a very simplistic understanding that they have this. They, no, the problem is the occupier. The problem is the bombs. The problem is clear. So if you at this stage of the game are actually blaming internal Muslims, if you are problematizing your Muslim brother and sister at this stage, then I'm sorry, even if your niyyah might be good, 
You are falling prey to exactly what the munafiqun did in the battle of Uhud. I'm sorry, but learn from the seerah. In the battle of Badr, Allah praised the Sahaba for coming together. The Ansar and Muhajirun united despite their differences. In the battle of Uhud, what did Allah criticize? Hatta idha fashiltum, watanazatum fil amri. When you differed amongst yourselves, that was the cause of your downfall. This is not the time to differ. Oh, Muslims who believe in Allah, get your differences aside. Set your differences aside for another time and place. This is not the time to internalize whether it's political and yes, wallahi, whether it is aqadi and manhaji differences, we can all be united that people of the kalima are being bombed because of the kalima. Let us be united in this. The real enemy, the real threat is not another Muslim who has a different understanding of Islam. The real threat are the people who are bombing, the people who are occupying. And if you cannot see this now, then honestly, either your iman or your sincerity, one of the two. Either you have to learn more iman or I'll be honest, we doubt your sincerity. We wonder where you're coming from here. So I have to call out this radicalist, simplistic, uber fundamentalist trends of Islam. They want to analyze this complex and they say, and they literally say, oh, the Palestinians or whoever they might be, you know, their aqidah is wrong or they have bid'ah or their teachers are like this or their fisq and fujud is happening there. La hawla wa la billah. So Allah is going to bomb children because they have minor fisq and fujud. Wallahi, what an understanding these people have. And I'm sorry, you're wrong intellectually, you're wrong emotionally, you're wrong logistically. So I have to call out these simplistic understandings and say, please, for the sake of Allah, study more deeply. Come together. And I say, even, even if you're passionate about the Khilafah or your version of Tawheed, okay, preach it or call for it, but still help other causes as well. You don't have to problematize other Muslims who disagree with your particular methodology because this is the problem. The problem is once you have given a solution that is incorrect, the Khilafah or Tawheed, for example, once you believe the solution is X, Y, and Z, then you come across other Muslims and those Muslims are not calling for your solution. If you are that narrow-minded that you think your solution is the only solution, then I understand you will problematize other Muslims. And I've seen this right now as this is happening. Right now, there are people releasing videos against other dua, shuyukh, and scholars. Oh, these people are saying, write letters to the politicians. Those are the real enemies. Subhanallah. Even if you disagree, you don't want to write letters to politicians. You don't need to call other Muslims enemies. You do you. You follow something good, but don't create division within the ummah. This is my second point. We need to be united. And this leads me to my third and final point. What then can be done? Again, this is the big question, right? And I have spoken in more detail in other lectures about my understanding of revival, my understanding of the reality of Iman and politics. And I admit and I confess, my opinion is one opinion. I could be right, I could be wrong. I'm willing to talk. And if you come to me with good matters and sincerity, you are my brother, even if you disagree. This is my attitude, my philosophy. You don't have to agree 100%. I could be wrong. My reading and analysis is that there's no doubt at the individual level, the priority for all of us at the individual level is that we should be motivated to be more spiritual. Our iman should be stronger. Our prayer, our dua, our ilm, our taqwa, there is no question this is a priority. And every one of us has to do this. I firmly believe this is the main mechanism. There is nothing that competes with this. But I also believe this is not enough. This is my understanding. I know some segments of the ummah disagree and they think we should only make dua and pray. And I'm trying to be respectful here. That's not the seerah. That's not the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Never, never did the Prophet just go and pray and do nothing for the dunya. He prayed to Hajjud and then in the daytime he will go knocking on doors. He would be preaching. He would be negotiating. He would be fighting if need be. In the night, to Hajjud. In the daytime, tactics. So I humbly submit and I know there are trends that have other interpretations. Let's discuss. Don't make me the enemy if I disagree. I'm quoting you the seerah. But in my humble opinion, prayer and dua to Hajjud and Nafil is not enough. That's step one, I agree. That's stage one, I agree. But there must be more. You must go beyond prayer and rituals. Now, what is beyond prayer and rituals? Here, once again, we have a whole plethora of groups here. Some groups say the Khilafah. Some groups say internal politics. Some groups say campaign media. Some groups say activism. And some groups have other things, not legal to mention over here, but you get this point here. I say, fi kullin khair. 
There is a point of legitimacy in all of these ideas. It's not one right opinion. And I, my humble advice to myself and all of you, what are you most passionate and what are you most capable of doing? In the end of the day, had we been over there, maybe our priorities would be different. We are in this land. And this land, our land, it is our country. It is the primary umbilical cord for that apartheid regime. That is the brutal fact of the matter. Without this country's support, and this country, whether we like it or not, this country, we are living in it. We are paying taxes to it. I know some of us have difficulty saying this, but I will say it bluntly. I was born here. This is my nation state. I have American citizenship, and I appreciate much of the positives, but I call out these negatives. And I must, on the day of judgment, answer to Allah, how was I living here? And I will answer Allah Azza wa Jalla, and I hope Allah forgives me by saying, I tried my best to speak out and say, not in my name. I tried my best to preach and teach. I tried my best to influence people in, in politics, in the media, amongst our society. I want change to come from within. Wallahi, I want good for this country. I don't want evil for it. And a part of that good, I don't want my country to be supporting an apartheid regime. And if all of us came together, millions of us came together, and we educated and we influenced other Americans and we saw and we and, and we started an actual campaign no more support to this apartheid regime we don't want our tax dollars going there I really believe the tide is changing look at the the next generation especially the younger generation especially they are much more aware they're much more open-minded it is my humble contention the reason why we're seeing such ferocity in the media the reason why we're seeing such a stark st contrast Trust is because they are desperate. They know they've lost the battle for the next generation. Even today, right after the bombing, they praised it. When they saw the reaction, they backtracked. Look, why did they backtrack? Because they saw the reaction. This is a reality. Even those regimes that are normalizing ties, they have to do some token effects because of public opinion. Do not underestimate public opinion. Do not underestimate the power of our own voices. So my humble ask to myself and all of you, what are you the most capable of doing? What are you passionate about? What are your resources? Whether it's in the media, whether it's in campaigning, whether it is in politics, whether it is in activism, from my perspective, fi kullin khair, there's good in all of them, but you have to do something. You cannot just sit back and ignore. And the, 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 the road ahead is very long. It's not going to be short here. But I tell you, as somebody who studies history, never before, never before have the Palestinian voices and the Palestinian side been given the amount of attention it has been given. Never. Yes, relatively, it's small. It's not equal 50-50. Right now, it's maybe 20-80 or 30-70. Right now, it's definitely not 50-50. But this is leaps and bounds ahead of even 10 years ago. For the very first time, Palestinians and Arabs are being put on mainstream media, even if partially, even if they're being interrogated. For the very first time, look at the comments underneath. Look at the reality of social media, and especially the youth and the second generation. We find a mass movement of genuine sympathy amongst people outside of our faith and even amongst many Israelis and many Jewish people of the next generation. There are protests by Jewish people against Zionism. Again, this is new. It didn't happen before. In the White House today in, in, in Washington, D.C., a Jewish group lobbied and they said we don't want this to have our money to be, to be spent over there. We don't want more lives to be lost. This is the first time it is happening. And so my third and final point is very simple. I don't have a one-path solution. I don't believe there's a one-path solution. I actually believe diversity is healthy. I'm not like the people in, in, in the second point that I mentioned, only one way, my way or the highway. No, I actually believe if some people want to do one thing, another people want to do another thing, there's actually good in this. Our hearts should be united. The goal is one. The goal is one, and that is the humane treatment of over two million people that are living there. And as I said in the khutbah, you don't even need to necessarily bring in Islam when you talk to your neighbors and relatives. You can bring in the humanitarian. But of course, if we're talking to Muslims, we'll bring in Islam. But the bottom line, sisters and brothers, we should not 
not be discouraged. We should not be disheartened. Yes, wallahi, it is painful. As the Prophet said, the heart is sad, the eyes cry, but the tongue will only say what Allah is pleased with. Insha'Allah ta'ala, the future is bright. Insha'Allah ta'ala, as Allah says in the Quran, don't think it is overall negative. It shall be positive. So every one of us, be motivated, be inspired, learn, study, read, listen to lectures, and then ask yourself, how can I contribute? Speak to others as well. Organize, lobby, protest. At every single level, things are happening. In the public schools, in the higher institutes, in corporations, things are happening. You can do a small bit. Do not trivialize. If you can change one, two, five people, and if every one of us changes one, two, five people, right here in this audience, we've changed 5,000. Right there. If everybody does this, slowly but surely, the tide will change. That is our battle. I call all of you to do what you can. Be proud of being Muslim. Be proud of standing up for the truth. Do not be discouraged by the temporary setbacks because the help of Allah shall come. We shall see victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I don't see it, my children will see it. We have to lay the foundations for that. There is no question that Allah's help is going to come. It's just a question of when. And we firmly believe, Allah, inna nasr Allahi qareeb. So we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us that nasr. We, must, we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be instruments of that nasr. We ask Allah azza wa to make us of those whose piety and taqwa and iman become role models for others. We ask Allah to give us the courage to speak the truth, to act the truth, to call to the truth. We seek refuge in Allah from the cowardice of hypocrisy. We seek refuge in Allah from hiding our iman in these times. We seek refuge in Allah from shunning away and running away from our intellectual battles. And we ask Allah for wisdom. We ask Allah for tact. We ask Allah for victory. And indeed, hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil huwa al mawla wa minhu al nasir. Wa jazakum Allahu khayran wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما